Hey, this is Grave Rose, and I'm going to be making a series of tutorials on how to map for Killing Floor. Um, I've learned this engine and all these different things, you know, the mediums for game design, at least working with this engine, uh, just over the years on my own. Um, I've been on a couple mod teams, I didn't really do much, but I have plenty of experience messing with this stuff. Uh, nothing truly, you know, professional or official by really any means or anything that I got paid for or whatever, but... I know quite a bit about it, and so I decided I feel like sharing that information because I don't know if anyone's made a consistent, you know, channel for tutorials or a series or anything like that. But even if they have, uh, it seems like something fun to do, a fun project. So I'm going to be starting with an intro that's going to go into the interface of the editor and sort of the flow and everything like that, hotkeys and different things you need to know, just kind of get familiarized with the interface and the certain functions that are going to be really fluent and consistent, you know. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a required prerequisite type of video before you go into the next stuff. You know, I would say that it's a bit kind of recommended, but uh, um, it would be recommended. Yeah, I would recommend watching it because it's going to be informative quite a bit and fill in a lot of the blanks on how to do things. There's some things that are going to be in this that might not pop up again, or at least it's just better to start from square one. So anyway, um, I'm going to put some background music on just so it doesn't sound so, you know, background noise and whatnot. I don't like that at all, so hopefully it won't be too distracting. Just some really quiet. So if you don't have the Killing Floor SDK installed, you come in here to Steam, you go under Library, and you go under Tools, and it's going to be the Killing Floor SDK here, and you just right click on it, and go to Install Game, and it should install it. So, if you want to, I don't know if by default it installs a shortcut icon, but if it does, that's cool, if it doesn't, then you need to go into your Killing Floor folder here, which is under Steam, Steam Apps, Common, Killing Floor. And it's going to be in your system folder, and it's going to be called KFED, and it should be like a, a teal logo here. And you can go ahead and make a shortcut from that or whatever. So I already got it open because it takes freaking forever to open. Um, so we're just going to go through basically the toolbar up here, the buttons up here, and what these are, and certain functions. Just kind of get uh, introduce you to the flow and how things are made or built. And, you know your, where your common tools are and presets and stuff like that and basically just where everything is so that's basically what this tutorial is about essentially it's just where everything is so you come in here under file you know you got your typical stuff new open save save as all that such your recent maps you know you can call them up from the list they're really easy um, don't confuse import and export with uh, importing and exporting content because it only really imports Unreal Text 3D and I don't know what the hell that is, I've never used it before but it's not, it has nothing to do with content really I mean you can export the map, that works but importing is kind of confusing so yeah, you don't import content through here and the INT, and, you know, you don't really have to worry about that either it makes an INT on its own every time you save the level out and stuff or play it and launch the game or whatever it automatically generates one so it's, yeah so go under edit, you got your typical stuff, undo, redo, search for actors will let you search down a specific actor class and, and move your camera right to it if you want to you know, find it and edit its properties, it's really great for that. Um, you got your typical stuff like cut, copy, paste, duplicate. Um, as you can see there's hockeys on the side if you want to get familiar with those right now, I mean some of them are universal like undo and redo for the most part and cut and copy and paste. Um, I would get familiar with those, but I'm going to go over the main ones later, the ones that are most important. But yeah, you can see there all these have hockeys. Um, a view is basically getting into your content browsers and looking at your log, and also just property windows, so you can modify things, basically. Um, also, I just, that just reminded me of something, though. Uh, your editor doesn't look like this when you first default install it or open it up. You're going to have this window over it and the tip of the day window. Uh, your tip of the day window is useful. For some reason, my tip of the day file is missing or something. I think I might have deleted it. But uh, if it is there for you, it's really useful having those tips. Uh, I learned a lot of small things from that. It'll tell you hotkeys and little tricks and stuff like that. Just useful information. 
So I'd check all those out and just try to, I don't know, I'd, I'd keep that up for a while until you get familiarized with this, but it's good to have that. This is your content browser, your inventory, whatever you want to call it, and it's got everything that's placeable and level design in here. You got your textures, actor classes, uh, meshes you never use because meshes are technically the same thing as animations or static meshes. Um, I've never seen this browser used before. Um, animations are like player models and zombies and just moving complex moving stuff. Static meshes are simplified moving or simplified meshes. They don't have animations or anything. You can animate them in a simple ways using a mover with the editor. But that's just key point movers like zero to one, you know, simple elevator type stuff. But uh, yeah, this is your unchangeable meshes. They just sit there in the map. They don't really do much, but they're mainly decorative or, you know, they can be used in many different ways. And prefabs, I've never seen that used either. I don't know what that is. Um, I have no idea what prefabs is, but I'm sure it has some kind of purpose, but you'll probably never use it. Um, groups is pretty useful. You can put all your actor classes into different groups and then you can hide and show them or select them, you know, it just makes it really easy to target a certain type of uh, sentimental group that you've made, you know, whatever it may be, like level one stuff or floor one stuff or whatever, or like in one of my levels I had a bunch of Legos and I wanted to separate them in different groups depending on their color, so, you know, red Legos, blue Legos, stuff like that. Uh, the sounds is all your sound effects. For some reason that's the first one it shows. Uh, the music tab is another thing that's never going to be used really. I don't even know what this is for because music is done differently in this game than using this music tab. It's a completely different process, so this thing's kind of a complete pointless piece of shit. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's not used really for anything. Like it just, I've never seen this used before and I don't know what it does, but it'd be cool to have a tab for music, but music in Killing Floor and this engine, as far as I know, I've always known, you can use a music trigger or you just go into your level properties and type in the name of the music file and the music file will be an OGG only OGG file that you drop in your music folder in the Killing Floor directory and then you basically reference it to the level properties uh, I might have to show you that sometime but uh, yeah the music tab the meshes tab and the prefabs tab you probably never use so just try to ignore those there's also another tab that's supposed to be on here that shows up under view it's called the impersonator browser, that's a lip sync animation. So you can Im import a voice and the model will talk to it kind of thing. That's pretty cool technology for the, you know, for engine as ghetto as this, they actually had it. But I don't know if they were ashamed of it or just decided to cut it out because no one used it, which doesn't make sense because no one uses these other tabs either. Um, but uh, that's what that is if you're ever curious about it. There might be a way you can restore it. I've restored it on uh, Unreal Tournament 2004's editor. So you might be able to do it the same way on Killing Floor if you want to mess with that stuff, but uh, yeah, that's what that is. So anyway, um, if you want your editor to look like these windows, by the way, like how mine is, I think by default you have a giant uh, top orthogonal, whatever it's called, view going over the top here, and then you got your front and sides around, and then a kind of a cut in half perspective. If you like this bigger one, or you just want to see the other options, you can go under View, Viewports, and go to Configure here. It gives you four different templates. This is a default one. Uh, I think I used this one for a while, but I like this side one because I just I'd rather have more height than width. The previous stuff, to be honest. So yeah, that's what I'm using there. Is that third one? So it just gives you a nice big window. Plus, you still have all your important, you know, top front and side. I would always want to keep those around if I were you. If you wanted to, though, you can maximize your viewport. Uh, to make it full screen down here at the bottom, or you can even go to viewports and go to float, which makes them detach and you can scale them to your own size and move them around. So, uh, the brush tab here, uh, brush is a big, very important concept, but I don't really want to get too deep into it right now. But basically, what you need to know about brush is it's basic, uh, I guess I wouldn't say basic, it's the building geometry that creates kind of the rendered aspects of your level. So, the stuff that the engine has to render that you create that's geometric is basically brush and you'll see what I mean later I guess I don't have the best way of explaining it but uh, it's created using shapes and you know whether it's these template shapes over here or it's a 2d shape editor or you import your own brush it's just the geometry that you bring in and you add it and subtract it you make it 
kind of show up in your world and then you build geometry or lighting on it and it has ray trace lighting so it has good shadows and stuff like that but it's it's built by the engine by the editor so it's not like a static mesh where you import it from some other thing and then just drop it in really simple like it's something that's kind of rendered by the engine that you build and you can cut away at it you can do a lot, a lot of different things to it it's got a lot of interesting properties for sculpting and stuff like that so it's kind of your building brush I guess I don't know that's probably the best way I can explain it really but you got all your properties for brush there add and subtract intersect de-intersect I wouldn't worry about any of that right now uh, we're gonna get into brush pretty uh, instructively and thorough in the next tutorial but I really don't want to take up a lot of time explaining it right now so go into build Build's pretty important I guess I'll explain that right now but that's always going to be an another relevant thing that comes up a lot so I think that will be explained pretty thorough just from using the engine using the editor but building is basically the act of keeping your level up to date so that you can play test it and use it so if you were to build a room for example you couldn't just drop a player start in there and then go play the game it wouldn't work that way you have to build a certain number of things before there's certain things that are rendered and official you know that are checked off before you can go and play test um, if it was a newer engine of course you can pretty much just drop right in and play test it but uh, in this one there's a couple things you have to do uh, if you were to build a room or something you need to build geometry if you had any lighting um, anytime you edit geometry the lighting for it gets reset so you have to build geometry then lighting again but lighting basically is just if you move a light bulb around or put a new light bulb in or change the color of it or something you have to build lighting again that's to get the shadows back uh, the change lighting is kind of it's theoretically supposed to just build the lighting you recently changed but I don't know how good it works um, it might the build pass and build change are kind of sketchy. It's hard to say when they work and when they don't, so I'd rather just do the full build. Uh, the build pass is anytime you do AI, like navigation points, whether it's path nodes, which are simple, you know, building a path or route for the AI to follow, or it's a player start or anything else that's navigation point based. You'll need to build your pass again before you can uh, play test and have the AI actually use it. So you can throw in a bunch of path nodes and navigation points and go playtest your map and it wouldn't give you an error or it wouldn't crash or give you a problem, but your AI won't know how to use it until you build pass through here. So it's just keeping things up to date and kind of rendering them out to the editor basically so that they can be used in game or look the way they're supposed to. So it's just officializing changes or additions you've done basically in the terms of geometry, lighting, and the AI. So the build all here we'll do all of them and that's pretty common sense the build options let you find tweak some stuff I've actually never really came in and find tweaked anything I don't know exactly how good it's gonna work uh, it might help you if you get some glitches or problems but it's also useful for telling you how many zones you have in the map uh, zones I'll get into that in the third tutorial but uh, they're basically the different sections of your level that are the render separates so that you don't load the whole map at once it will delete your uh, coal I should say it will coal away stuff that you're not uh, actually looking at or that's not in your line of sight if it happens to be in a different zone so it's part of optimization and culling I'll, my third tutorial is going to be about that it's really important so I want to jump into that uh, pretty quick so uh the tools over here. You got the 2D shape editor, you got scale lights, check map for errors, scale map, just a bunch of little useful kind of tools and things that come with it of course. Uh, the particle editor lets you make like fire and smoke and stuff like that. Uh, you know, sprite based things or whatever it may be, it doesn't exactly have to be, well yeah, it usually is sprites actually. Um, so, so anything that's kind of two dimensional textures that you make like a, a 3D sprite kind of thing with like smoke or lasers or whatever, that's in the particle editor. Um, if you've made like a workshop content, like a map or whatever, you also have that tool here, like upload file, and you get this pop-up thing. So yeah, that's all under tools. Help is very small and, and very unuseful. Um, the context help might be, if it even's there. Oh, never mind, there isn't a goddamn context help. Uh, the tip of the day doesn't work on mine, and I think I deleted the file. The context help is a complete piece of shit that doesn't work, because you go to click on something to have it tell you what it is or whatever 
and it doesn't do shit. It just says help topic not found, so you're kind of screwed on that. Um, the Unreal Developer Network's a website, but I don't know if they have their Unreal Engine 2 information and all that stuff up anymore. They used to, but ever since Unreal Engine 3 became pretty uh, commercial and all that stuff, they've made that public, and I think the Unreal Engine 2 is locked away now, so you can't get into it. So I don't know how helpful that's going to be. Uh, there are other resources. I mean, it's not like only a few people make levels or content for these older Unreal Engine games. I mean, there's a lot of people that do. So forums and, you know, uh, Unreal Wiki or whatever. There's a couple of sites I always go to for information about the engine or property definitions, like if I want to know how to do something or whatever. So there's a lot of resources, even though the engine or the editor doesn't really come with any. So off of that, you got your bar here. Uh, and this bar here is basically like a summary of a lot of the stuff that's under here. You know, it's just kind of a simplification bar to make things kind of easy and shortcutted. So you got your undo, your search. From here all the way to this pawn icon to the A is your uh, show after class browser all the way to your uh, animation or texture browser. It's not in the same order though, this is the animation browser, your texture browser is there. So I would get familiar with these buttons because these are the shortcuts to getting into your content if you ever close this window. Uh, the, this here is a 2D shape editor and this is a great editor for making brush three dimensional or you know make it into like a trapezoid kind of beveled shape or a pyramid, you can make a lot of interesting brush shapes for this, for your layout of your level or whatever. The only problem with this is you need to be very precise and you probably need to make a new folder and save every single shape you make if it's important because once you close out of this editor, this box here, it doesn't matter what kind of crazy, creative, important shape you made to your map, it doesn't give you the option to save, it'll just close out. And then when you open it back up, it's not going to have it there again, it, it wipes it. So if you're going to use this to make build your level on and make your level layout and all that stuff, just be aware that it, it sucks ass with, uh, it's dangerous to use if you <laughs> want to preserve your files and not lose your shapes that you're making. So I would save every single thing that's important in its own folder called shapes, 2D shapes or something. It doesn't have that folder by default, but just save your shit, you know, that's all I'm going to say. I used this for a long time before I started using a third party program, which is Maya. Uh, modeling program, animation program. Uh, build my layouts and stuff in there. It's much easier and way quicker. I get a lot more control. Uh, I have it proportionalized so I know how to import it in here and get it to the right scale. And then I just bring it in here as brush and add it and it works great. So that's the way I like to do it. But if you don't have that shit, I mean, this works just fine. So it's just tricky as all. You know, you might lose your stuff. So save your stuff. But I'm going to get into that in the next one. I don't think I'm going to be using Maya for building maps and stuff. I think I'm going to stick to the stuff that comes with the editor. Because if I start using fancy programs and stuff, you're going to feel left out and like wonder how I did that. And I don't know if I want to make tutorials for the third-party stuff quite yet. I don't even know if I want to involve that in the process. I might, but I'm going to stick and make it fair ground and just stick with the editor doing that during these tutorials. So over here you got a script editor, uh, this is for viewing and exporting and compiling your own code and stuff. It's not very friendly and, and great from what I hear. I don't know much about programming, but I think from what I hear a lot this isn't that useful. But uh, if you're making your own mutator, um, exporting your own mutator here, or at least getting your foundation script, it will automatically generate the folders and stuff for you, your directories and UC file and all that, if you make it through here. So that's one useful thing about that. Um, also, if you want to look at code from individual classes that are inside the engine or inside objects or placeable classes and stuff like that, you can open up your actor class browser and just double click on one of them and it will pop up the script for it and you can look at all the code. So that's another useful thing about the script editor here is it will let you look at the code and you can copy it and take it or whatever. Unless you have a program called Watgrill, which I use, W-O-T-G-R-E-A-L. It's a really useful Unreal Engine program that imports all the UC files, the default script that comes with the game, all your classes and stuff, and lets you have all that in a kind of a notepad, kind of wordpad, uh, whatever it's called, word entry type program, so you can write your own code and look at the code that comes with the game, so that's pretty useful. So off of that, you got your actor properties, and you got your surface properties. Surfaces are brush faces, so it's the surfaces of a brush. 
um, that are ray traced and all that. It's just your brush surfaces, they have it their own window because you can move them and pan them and align them in different ways. You can also set different details for the light map, like the shadow detail. Uh, you can change the texture scale and you can also add flags which are marking it as invisible or two-sided or special lit or fake backdrop and stuff like that. Uh, the actor properties window is going to be used a lot. The, that's the properties for anything that's an actor class, which is most things like your brush, your static meshes, your uh, particles, you know, uh, water, anything that's placeable in the level that's an object is basically going to have properties that you control in here. So, I uh, already gone over the build stuff. These, these are the shortcut keys for that, or the shortcut buttons. And so that pretty much summarizes that. I guess I'll jump into the viewport options here. So as you can see, we got the perspective view, and we got the. Uh, hang on. All right. I just want to see how long this is going on. All right. So as you can see, we got the perspective view, we got the top, front, and side. All these windows, these viewports, have the same options up top. Um, the 2TFS is to put it into one of those modes. So if you want your big screen to become a top view or whatever, you can go to that. Uh, all these modes here that are these cube shapes and stuff, those are all based on the perspective view. Um, I'll go over those in a second. This controller icon right here is a real-time preview so if you have portals in the level that are blocking your view or s stuff like that or uh, sound effects you want to hear basically anything that you'd kind of interact with in the game or see moving or working in real time you know happening in the present tense you can make that come alive using this button uh, players won't spawn it's not going to be like crisis engine where you got AI walking and patrolling the level while you're working on the map, I don't know how that's possible or what the hell they try to do with that. I and mean, that's kind of distracting and gets in the way a little bit, I would think. But it's not that in depth and interesting, but it will bring your sound effects and particles and stuff to life. So that's cool. It's very useful. Uh, going into these different modes here for the perspective view, you got your wireframe. You're not going to be able to tell right now, so why don't I load up a level? Let's load up one of mine. Since it's really very simple right now and looks really basic it won't be too long to load or anything okay so this is a level I'm working on called House on Haunted Hill which is based on a movie from 1999 and it's really basic right now which is perfect for this this will be a good kind of tutorial thing to show you a lot of the different hotkeys and rendering modes so your wireframe is just kind of a simple geometric shape of it it's let you see, you know, it takes off the textures and everything, and you just see the three dimensions, the the edges of things. It doesn't have any detail as far as textures and lighting and all that stuff. It's just wireframe. The texture you use is it will assign a different color to every specific texture, so it will just show you your, your uh, density or variety of what textures you have in your level. The DSP cuts, I'm not exactly sure what that does, but as far as I can tell, it just makes brush go white and I don't know if it has any other colors or notifications or whatnot, but it's basically just brush goes white, kind of not very useful. Um, the textured is without lighting, but it shows everything rendered out. You know, you got your textures and shaders working and all that, but it just doesn't have lighting. Uh, your lighting only will take off the textures and just show the lighting detail. So if you want to see exactly how shadows are coming up on stuff, you know, you can see how that works pretty good. Oh yeah, I had a model there. <laughs> Just testing out some character models. And the dynamic light is the pretty much the closest how it's gonna look when it's done. So this is pretty much how it's gonna look in game, aside from the you know brush and stuff floating around. Uh, this is the zone portal, which every single room that's portaled, or every single portal, we'll get to that in the third tutorial, will have its own color. And I'll show you how to make uh, portals and why they're important. But yeah, they just have their own color in this view. The unknown is another useless thing you won't be using. There's quite a few of those of useless things in this editor, actually. There's things you pretty much never use, but they take up quite a bit of respectable space or whatever, like they're important, but they're really not. So I don't really know what this is for, aside from tripping you out, but 
it's there. It's called a known. See, it doesn't even have a goddamn name. It's just called a known. So whatever it does, I don't know. It's a mystery. So respect the mystery, I guess. This is your lock to selected actor. You click on something, you click on this, and it's supposed to... Maybe I got the order wrong. Yeah, there we go. You click on that first, then you select your actor, and it will basically attach the actor to your camera so that you're moving it around on your camera. So it's kind of making it being placed depending on your movement of your camera, which is kind of cool, I guess. So it just locks it to the camera as you move around. So it works in a way like a unique kind of panning tool or something, placement tool. This is show large vertices, which you can see this little pivot point here gets bigger. Um, if I had my brush sel selected here, my active brush, you would see the edges on the brush, the vertices, the points, my bad, not the edges, <coughs> the points on the brush, uh, they get bigger. So that's all that is, it just makes them easier to select if you were to be editing them or whatever. Um, these are just shortcut keys for show terrain and show fog. I'll get into the shortcut keys later, but as you can see, you know, distant fog, you can trigger on and off with the shortcut key or that button. The other one is for terrain. Don't have any terrain in here to demonstrate on, but it's okay. Probably won't be in the final thing either, because it's all indoor. But uh, aside from that, if you right click, you got all these different things that come up as well. You know, you got mode. Um, just pretty much a summary of all the stuff that's over here for the most part. Um, this view does show a lot more. I mean, if they did expand on and make more than two buttons here, they could run it all the way on quite some time and have all this stuff up here. But this is just the full index of all the stuff that you can show and hide. You got pass, turn on pass, and you can see the, the pass between all the AI. That's really useful if you want to see how things are working, how the relationship your pass is working. It's very important to see those. Um, you got volumes, which has a hotkey, which is O. I'm not going to get into the hockey thread this minute though. You can see the zombie volume disappear when I push out. Okay, that's volumetric. It's a volume. But uh, that's basically that. The properties of the windows. Um, you also got other things like changing the color mode and, you know, it's basically just a summary of the stuff that's up here, but also it gives you more than what's up there. But the same kind of idea. So off of that, um, let's go through this stuff real quick on the side at the bottom and that will basically be it and then I'll go over uh, some important hotkeys and controls so these tools up here that are expanded under this arrow as you can see everything's kind of categorized in its own section that it can be expanded or collapsed I just like to keep everything expanded so I can see everything I mean why hide it if you have all this room it's not like it's going off on some drop or some scroll or whatever where you have to scroll down a whole bunch I mean it's all on the side there so I would recommend just expanding all of it so you can see it all but this first section here is your tools and, and kind of your uh, select selection modes or whatever. It changes the camera cursor to something else and gives it a different property. So this first one is basically just a camera mover and your select tool. It is the most primary, the one you're going to be using like 70% of the time. So This one is a vertex editing where you can select on the corners of shapes and you can edit them, move them around. You can do that with control, drag. I wouldn't recommend doing that because editing brush in this engine anyway, in this editor. Uh, I seem to always say those two words together. Um, it has some glitching problems and some issues um, when you're trying to edit brush. It will cause some kind of a glitch or problem. If you if your brush is too complicated and has too much weird, uh, what's the word, arbitrary designs to it, it just has too many divisions and kind of weird points going on and stuff. Even if it's not that bizarre or, you know, an ordinary, it will still give you issues a lot of the time, it's simply because it's trash, I don't know exactly why, but it's got a lot of problems with making specific, customized, unique shapes. So if you're going to be doing a lot of custom pulling and shape editing stuff in this editor, I'd be really careful what you tweak and build geometry like every step of the way to make sure it's actually working and not giving you glitches and sometimes it'll even crash your shit, so you got to watch out. Uh, aside from that, you got your scale actor and your rotate actor. Those are based on control as well, control drag. Uh, you'll see in a minute when I go over the hotkeys and the movement control stuff that control is used a lot as a hotkey or a key that you need to hold down to do a certain function. So control drag and right drag or both drags will scale it in different directions. The rotate works kind of the same way. Um, your texture and pan and rotate are on surfaces. And you use control and, and drag the same way as you do with the scaler, and it will move the surfaces or rotate them. 
This is a brush clipping, just some kind of neat uh, just brush editing mode. It lets you clip off edges and stuff with certain things. Probably won't be using these a lot, or the freehand, because it's just stuff that's going to cause complicated shapes and like glitch stuff out. I mean, use at your own risk kind of thing, you know. But the free polygon tool lets you kind of create your own shapes. You just draw on your own shapes in the 3D space, I think. I've only used it a few times, but it's pretty tricky, and it's just kind of a pain in the ass, So, and it can cause glitches and problems. So I would avoid a couple of these tools. A uh, face drag lets you drag surfaces out, bringing the whole face or wall out. The train editor tool here actually will be used a lot. This is very useful. Uh, any map that you see hills or complex geometry, like Mountain Pass, for example, or the courtyard in, in Bedlam, uh, things like that, those are terrain. Or wires built completely on terrain, that's probably a better example. Well, so is Mountain Pass, that's true. Uh, but yeah, so the train editor, you can do a lot of different things in here. You got all your editing tools here, smoothing, painting, noise, flatten. You can paint away the visibility so you don't have areas that are tucked away that no one's going to see, but they're rendering anyway. You can delete them. You got layers, you can make all sorts of different layers for grass and rock and dirt and wood chips and stuff, whatever, asphalt. Uh, decorations as 3D models you can paint on the train, like br uh, bushes and trees and stuff like that. Just know that if you're going to do something that you intend the players to collide into, like a tree trunk or a tree, it doesn't have collision or an option for collision on the decoration. So if you open up wire, for example, the map wire, you can see all the different trees in the map all have a manually placed purple looking static mesh inside of it. It's invisible in the actual game, but the mapper had to go in and manually place all that shit to compensate for the lack of a collision option on the decoration layer. So you can't do collision. If you were going to do wanted to make a bunch of trees on your level, you'd have to go through every individual tree and place a manual invisible mesh to be inside of it to act as a collision to substitute. So set yourself up for that pain in the ass if you want. But it's just something to know. Um, but the move editor here, this is matinee. It's basically like movies in the editor. You can do flybys of your map. You can do triggered events, you know, cutscenes, stuff like that. That's all done in here. I actually used this once in for Unreal Tournament 2004. I made a India level because I was doing a project for school, and they let me use the editor to to do the project. I guess the teacher was curious or something. But I made a documentary about you know facts of India, and me and my friend did it. And we used Matt and Ian to sit a fly through. We had commentary and a title screen and animation events that came up and triggered certain things to happen. It was actually pretty extravagant. I think we got an A on it, but it, yeah, I mean, you can do a lot of different uh, stuff with it. I mean, it doesn't even have to be related to the game or anything. You can make your own movies and projects and stuff with it. It's pretty useful. So, I mean, I made it for ninth grade geography class and I got a good grade on it, so it contradicts the having to be bound for, to the game or whatever. You can do a lot with it and get creative with it. Um, aside from that, just more brush clipping stuff. You probably won't use much of this. I'm not even going to show it, but it's, it's I'm sure it's useful for some things, but I'm just afraid of running into glitches and problems and stuff like that with brush. And I don't want to have to deal with crashing all the time and making things that are just irreversibly fucked up, so... But yeah, that's just some more useful uh, brush editor stuff for clipping faces and whatever. This stuff here is your templates for your building. It's your basic building blocks of things. You know, you got your cube, your steps, you know, your flat surfaces, your planes, or whatever, your cylinders, pyramids. If you wanted to make a really basic room that's a square or a staircase, instead of have to build that all custom and stuff if you don't want, that's what these are here for. So they just let you have quick access to some simple shapes if you want to throw those in and not have to make them on your own. <coughs> uh, if you right click on these windows here, at least on these tools, I don't know about all the rest, I'm pretty sure the others don't do it. But, uh, I mean, a couple of them do, like Mover and uh, Volume. But, yeah, if you right-click on some of these buttons, it'll give you a little expander window or something that'll come up. But you could change the properties, you know, the width and height and all the stuff that's kind of relevant to that shape. So you can customize it before you place it, which is pretty useful. Like you can choose how many steps there are, or the width of the step, or the height. Um, how much height is added to the first step, whatever. Just kind of creative stuff like that to make it more unique to your level, your needs, or whatever. Uh, this section here is very important. It's how the brush interacts with the world. I'm going to get into that in the next tutorial. But there's add, subtract, intersect, and de-intersect. So that might be confusing for now, but I'm going to get into that in the next tutorial, what adds and subtracts are. 
intersect and intersect are basically collision, having things kind of overlap, uh, with, have a brush over the top of stuff, and then you click intersect or whatever, and it, it kind of wraps around the nearest shape and creates a new brush off of that or whatever. So it's, I'll have to show that sometime. But uh, I don't want to get too complicated in the brush or how it works quite yet, because that's just a different thing entirely. That's more into working the editor rather than just showing the buttons and then the functions. Uh, this is special brush, so if you wanted to do certain flags, like make the brush so players couldn't touch it or it doesn't collide like a typical brush does, or put flags on it so it's invisible or whatever, you can do that. That's going to be used for making zone portals. You're going to be using that a lot for making zone portals. Add static mesh as a static mesh converter, so if you wanted to convert a shape you made in here to a static mesh to be organized in here under your own package, your own indexing in here, you can do that. Um, I'm not gonna probably won't be using that, but maybe we'll have to see. But that's just where that is. Add mover is if you want to add like a door that opens up or an elevator, pretty much anything that you touch it or trigger and it moves that you can step on or interact with or whatever. And movers are static mesh based, so you would select a static mesh in here and then you would click add mover and it would take and make a mover based on your current selection in the static mesh browser. Um, the add anti-portal is part of optimization. Anti-portals are kind of the, they tackle the other aspect of culling and optimization that zone portals don't. Uh, I'm going to save that for the third tutorial, but that's where that button is. It's volumetric, so when you push O on your keyboard, uh, anti-portals will disappear the same as uh, volumes do. And that's the next thing here is volumes. Volumes are these gray boxes. Um, you can hide those with O, like I just said. You'll probably be doing that a lot, actually, if you're going to be checking out uh, other people's maps, or just as your map becomes more dense and filled up, you're going to be seeing a lot of these gray boxes taking up a lot of your screen space. So if you want to kind of get those out of the way to make it easier to see, just push O, and uh, they'll disappear. So, But volumes are just anything that's volumetric-based. That could be a trigger, could be physics volumes, water volumes. Um, it could be a shop volume, like you stand inside this volume and it lets you use the trader, you know, and shop and stuff like that. It could be a, a spawn volume that creates zombies. It's stuff that's just based around a certain physical shape that has a certain function. So it can be physics based, it can be, you know, more creative like the trader using, you know, proximity stuff or whatever in just certain circumstances or whatever, but it's based around volumes and, and geometry. So they're very useful. But the main ones you're going to be using are a zombie zone volume, which is like a blocking volume for players that zombies can pass through. It's to set your, your bounds of your level, but the zombies can come through, like uh, spawn areas and stuff. And also your zombie spawns, and maybe a uh, water volume too, but I've never seen water volume used in Killing Floor. I know it works, there's nothing wrong with it, but you, you never see the default maps or anything having water in them that you can actually swim in and stuff like that, so... Yeah, it's mainly going to be physics volumes, or zombie spawns, and zombie zone volumes, or blocking volumes, whatever. But, uh, going on to the next section, this is just show and hide, and show all, invert selection, and then this is really important here, you got your camera movement. The third one's the fastest, and the first one's the slowest, and as you guessed, uh, you know, the second's the medium, so. That's just your camera speed. You're going to be using that one a lot. The X, Y, and Z is a mirror, so you would just <coughs> select something and click that and it would mirror it over your axis here whatever, it would mirror it to the other side so it's mirrored, yeah <laughs> that might be useful if you want a symmetrical level that was like capture the flag or whatever you might be able to mirror stuff that way really easily, I think I'd done that before using these, so that's really useful this is select all inside, so if you had like a brush here for example, you can use this as a selection area and just click select all inside and supposedly it's supposed to select everything that's inside of it, but I don't see it working. So maybe it doesn't work with that, I don't know. But that's supposed to be what it does. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the Z, I'm not sure what that does entirely. It's, it's called Clip Z in Wireframe. Um, it might be useful for something, but I've never used it. The Align View on Actor just moves your camera to an actor. So that's pretty useful you had some selected way across the map and you wanted to teleport to it because you wanted to be by it for whatever reason you can click on this button it'll just teleport you to it so I got that ambient sound selected click on that move your camera and there we go I'm over here <coughs> 
So this is the command line. You can input your own commands. I don't know any commands or exactly what the use of that would be, but I'm sure there's many uses. It's always good to have a command line for programs. Input your own stuff. This is the log. Pretty much errors and just anything that's, that's going on behind the scenes. It will tell you in here. And uh, you got your lock selections. You got your toggle vertex snap. This is a drag grid, which is really important. Turning this off makes things move in decimal increments, which is really kind of a pain, really. You might want to stick to units. But I like to snap it to ones, just because it's a small unit still, but it's not decimal, so it's not confusing and way too precise. The drag grid, the rotation grid is the same thing, but for rotating. So you can ro rotate in increments, or you can rotate in de decimals that are very arbitrary and large numbers, so it just depends on how you want to do it. This is the maximized viewport, and then you got a simplified kind of shortcut to your draw scale. The draw scale is the size of something. Um, you can also find that inside the active properties of something. So if I want to make the scale of this chair bigger, I can do it here. Or I can go up here to the, not my bad, the active properties. There's many ways to get to the active properties. You can do the shortcut here, you can double click, or you can right click and go to static mesh properties. There might be even more ways to get into it. But yeah, you go into the display, and under draw scale 3D, you got the same stuff that is down here. So this is just a shortcut to that draw scale, because I guess they figured it'd be used a lot. So they might as well just throw it on your main area to be found easy, I guess, like a shortcut. So that's kind of useful. So that's basically everything in the editor then. And uh, so now I'll just get onto hotkeys and summarize this. So. As you can see, I uh, went over everything basically. There aren't any translate tools or rotate tools like you might see in other programs. This is kind of a bitch, but at the same time, I'm going to fix that right now for you so you're not confused anymore. But basically, the translate or the function for rotating and moving things, whatever, is going to be control drag. So if you wanted to move something on the x axis, you would hold, select it, hold down control, and then drag with your, your uh, left mouse. It moves across to x. The right mouse control drag is Y, and then if you do both clicks at the same time, your left and right, it will do an up and down. Um, if you hold down Alt with control and do the same uh, left and right clicks, it will do different things. Um, I believe the right is supposed to move the pivot point, but I guess that doesn't work on this. And the right click drag with control and Alt is a rotate. My bad, the left is supposed to move the pivot, not the right. But it's not working on here for some reason. It might only work on brush. This is a static mesh. Um, both clicks at once will let you kind of free transform it, so you can kind of just move it around all over the place. It's not moving in one direction or the other. It's kind of based on your perspective. So it's treating your point of view on the camera like if it's two-dimensional, and you're just kind of moving it around, if that makes sense. Um, the control drag has different properties up in these top right or front and side simply because they're two dimensional, so they work differently. Uh, the control left drag will let you move things around the same way that uh, control alt double drag does in the perspective view. It kind of just lets you move around on two different axes <coughs> based on your camera angle. You know, I'm in the top view, so it's moving on X and Y. Uh, on the right, we'll do a rotate, a control right drag, and a double doesn't do anything in these. Um, that's true for all these. Also, there is a control alt drag in here, and that's a marquee selection. So, if you want to select inside a box, that's control alt drag. And if you wanted to, to select to amend to a selection you already had, like let's say you had this stuff selected, but you also wanted to marquee select the table stuff, you can hold down shift and then control alt drag, and it will amend with that marquee. So, there you go, I still have these stuff selected. So that's pretty much the control hotkeys, it's just mainly control and alt that are important. Um, some other hotkeys to know, you got Q, Q is going to hide hide brush, which is your you know building block stuff, your rooms and whatnot. Um, w is going to hide your static meshes, or anything that falls under the category of static meshes, like movers and whatever it may be. Uh, F is fog, T is terrain, O is volumes, and... Let's see what other ones we got here. Yeah, you got selection highlights. So if you don't want to have a, a glow come off of something, you could push S. I wouldn't recommend that because it'd probably confuse the hell out of you and you won't know what's going on. And T 
strain, I already said that. There should be one for fluid surface. Oh, yeah, it doesn't have a shortcut though. So yeah, that's pretty much all the main hotkeys you need to know. Aside from, uh, also, yeah. Uh, duplicate is not control D like you would normally think. It's going to be control W. So control D is the intersect on the brush mode right here. But control W is duplicate. So don't confuse with the universal duplicate hotkey. It's not the same in this editor. It's going to be control W. So there you go. That's pretty much a, a summary of everything that's in the editor. And in a very you know quick glance, kind of flying through it, giving some description. So we're going to fly into a tutorial on how to make a working killing floor map. Maybe I'll use this level as a base, but I think I want to start from the ground up just so you get a, a full idea of how levels build from scratch. Yeah, let's do that. And that one might be an hour or so long. It's going to have a lot of information in it, so we'll jump right into that basically and get started with the actual making maps and whatnot using the editor. So thanks for watching, and hopefully you want to learn more. So, cheerio.